Whispering podcast explores guests' encounters with the other world of fairy and ways of connecting with this realm. From listening to messages in owl's hoots, finding a four-leaf clover, chasing rainbows or inviting a gnome to dinner. I'm Claire Sylvan Wand, a fairy whisperer, researcher and your guide on this journey. Take my hand and step into the twilight woodland where they are waiting to meet you. listeners a happy and magical solstice. I'm still recovering from the flu. Apologies that I was unable to record my usual intro and outro for the episode with C.G. Michaels. I've only just got my voice back and stopped coughing. (laughs) Before I introduce my guest for this episode, a reminder that you can follow the podcast on Instagram at fairy underscore whispering underscore podcast. I also have a Facebook page of the same name, Fairy Whispering Podcast, Twitter at Fairy Whispering, and on my Fairy Whisperer YouTube channel, where there are video versions of all my episodes, including this one. All show notes are available on the podcast blog at www.fairywhisperer.co.uk and I spell fairy, F-A-E-R-Y, on my website. And if you're enjoying the podcast and want to support my work, please consider making a donation via my Fairy Whisperer Buy Me A Coffee page. Every donation helps me to keep the podcast going. Thank you. Thank you to Third Girl from the Left for allowing me to use their track, Oxygen, for the show theme music. Now on to my guest. In this episode, I chat with Rachel A. Blackwell, an illustrator and mural artist from the UK. She calls the enchanted realm that her paintings are based within the ethereal earth. Rachel shares about her connection to the land and a life-changing event that opened her up to some beautiful realisations and fey experiences. Whilst receiving sound healing at a special retreat centre, Rachel overheard three female fairies discussing her life. We talk about who these fae could be and what they were saying about Rachel and her life. Plus, we discuss Rachel's connection with nature, dragons and her discovery of a special fairy door in Woodland whilst she was searching for a tree staff. My conversation with Rachel was both very moving and uplifting and will bring some hope to anyone struggling at this time. I was moved to tears during this conversation, so have your hankies at the ready. In the video version, you can see some of Rachel's incredible artwork too. These episodes contain adult themes and some scary elements, so these aren't for young children. I'd recommend age 16 plus for listeners. I will come back to you at the end with some closing thoughts. Today I have Rachel Blackwell with me. So glad to have you as a guest. I'm delighted to be here. This is so yeah. exciting. <laughs> yeah, it's been a really transformative time. Um, so I don't even know where to start with that, really. <laughs> so back in 2019, um, I, oh, how do I start? So I think it started going to Five Rhythms Dancing, um, which is like a conscious sort of shamanic dance, Mm. which led me to go to a place called Wild Ways, um, which is a retreat centre in Shropshire run by Druids. Um, And uh, I had some quite intense experiences at that weekend and really got back in touch with my 
inner being and myself and what was true for me. And not long after that, I broke up with my partner of 13 years, um, which was quite oh scary times. Mm-hmm. Um, and then four months later, the pandemic hit and we got two weeks before the lockdown, I moved in with some people to be their lodger. Okay. Um, and then... Gosh, it just all exploded. So I ended up living in my van in Kidderminster, in Glastonbury, in Starport, and then became homeless for 20 minutes. Oh, and oh gosh, I feel like I'm rambling and not getting this. No, no, carry on. This is all really wonderful, really interesting. So a lot of people will connect with this, what you're saying, I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I had to kind of completely let surrender to the universe and allow it to just spirit the universe my guides to really show me the way because I didn't know the way um so there was this Scorpio full moon in the first lockdown where everything exploded and I ended up instead of going back to where I was living which wasn't working for anybody there um, I ended up staying in my van and just being in the light of this Scorpio full moon. And then I ended up homeless-ish with my van. Um, and I put a post on Facebook going, help! Mm, <laughs> and I've got nowhere to live. And I had, within like hours, I had 30 places to live. And oh, so... God. I, <laughs> yeah. Um, which led me to over towards Shropshire Um, and I spent I spent a lot of time connecting with the land and with the beings of the land both seen and unseen and that gave me a really good grounding and healing and strength Um, Mm. and then I was invited down to Glastonbury for a month to paint a mural for the mural trail and spent a month living on the high street in Glastonbury Um, so which (laughs) which was completely wild (laughs) (laughs) yeah Um, wow which which was great fun um but also kind of it was like oh I'm really enjoying this ah this is scary and terrible (laughs) um um (laughs) <laughs> yeah so like I can imagine the ups and downs gosh for yeah. thinking yeah yeah yes. especially with the complete surrender to it all and they're just mm. like enjoying the and then the like ah um, <laughs> mm. so and then I got a commission through to paint um this enormous mural for someone's private swimming pool um <laughs> in Sailey Hill so I knew I had to come back up this way yeah so I found somewhere to live um in near Starport um in a place called Wilden uh that was just by this beautiful red sand common um so I painted that and then decided to stay there for a while and kind of try and get some ground beneath my feet and get myself properly on my feet mm. um, but then I broke my ankle. <laughs> oh, gosh. <laughs> After months, yeah. I was exploring these um, industrial ruins that had got mm. this amazing graffiti with a friend. And then I um, I jumped off a small wall and it just went. Oh, oh. Um, so, yeah. Uh, that And I was living up in this attic and the people I was living with didn't, weren't really there <laughs> so that was another kind of oh my god what's happened to my life and then we're in lockdown and I did this um series called a light in the darkness from the Samhain to the winter solstice that year basically to keep myself sane um mm. but so every day I came up with a new image and painted it and there's 50 um paintings in that series and it's really interesting people's responses to it um that one because 
it there's a lot of hope in there but there's also it is like darkness and with the light um mm-hmm. in it and I'm hoping that might get turned into an oracle set at some Ooh. point um, yeah that's I just had a yes then in my yeah in my body with that mm-hmm. yeah that sounds really powerful mm. it was really really powerful um strangely I'd set the intention a week before I broke my ankle that I'd been on a dancing retreat for five days and um, and I set the intention at the ending circle to live purposefully and on purpose mm-hmm. and yeah be careful what you wish for <laughs> because just over a week later I got I landed back from the hospital I made myself a cup of tea and then I didn't know how I was going to get that cup of tea from the kettle to somewhere to sit and drink it and go out in the garden and everything that had to do had to be fully planned and fully on purpose and oh my gosh Mm. I kind of mm, yeah so that was a very interesting experience Mm. Um, yeah yeah is and you have this connection with the fae and the other world very close connection that you channel into your art you're just saying your oracle what what sort of guidance were they giving you as part of this journey what sort of guidance did you receive or was it very just very much felt and you were just following your intuition and then given signs or 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 did you have any sort of direct messages or visualizations or dreams or of any kind that guided you yeah so the vision I got was of the earth pulling me down by my ankle and telling myself, telling me quite firmly, ground yourself. Mm. Um, and I had, it came through, uh, so I sat in the garden every day and I made friends with a robin um, and it would, <laughs> and I got some bird feed. And so every morning I'd go out and drink my cup of tea and give some bird feed. And after a few weeks, it would come and sit on my broken ankle boot. And <laughs> oh, that's beautiful. And it felt like nature, nature spirit, the robin was like supporting me. And mm. um, I also had a blue tip fly. I was living in this attic and a blue tip flew into the room. And I've got a thing about sometimes Faye don't come as what you they transform and shape shift and yes. will come in the most comfortable form. To, mm-hmm. Yeah. And if a little fairy had come and flown into my room at that time, I'd have thought I'd gone insane. Mm-hmm. So a blue tit flying into the room, it just felt like a real message of like hope and yeah. yeah, just real hope and that the lightness is mm-hmm. still here. And hmm. um, you can get through this. That's all right. And I ended up drawing a blue tit um, talking to a fairy um, that day. It's, it just. Oh, kind of, I'm going to yeah. cry. I'm just, this is so beautiful. I mean, I love, I love your art. And when, you know, people please check out Rachel's art. Um, it's amazing. I'll put your details off in the description for this um, episode. Thank you. So people can find you, but yeah. So what an amazing experience to have. So you you were very guided by nature, the other world, yeah. at the time. Oh, and then and so that moved your art forward as well. And it did. Um, yeah, yeah. And and did you continue to have connection with these birds, or has that sort of flourished since then? or with other birds or is it just something of that time so I I kind of have these little experience magical nature experiences from time to time that feel like spirit fairy I never know what to call it is speaking to me through it um Mm. so 
the latest one was an owl um that oh. um which was really beautiful um the other week I was driving home in the dark down the lane from a friend's house and I think there was a thing in the middle of the road <laughs> and um I drove it I slowed down and I got there and then there was this owl and it just took flight in front of me and was flying in front of my van for ages and ages. And it just felt so magical. Um, so the next day I was like, I've got to paint this owl now. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. I painted that one and um, as I was painting it, these blue roses appeared in its talons um, with little tiny fairies. Oh. <laughs> Oh, that sounds gorgeous. Yeah. Oh. And what was the significance of the blue roses for you? Is there anything that it just felt like a gift or was it an, something symbolic for you? Um, I don't think I've quite worked that out yet. It's yeah. It's like a puzzle because I was looking at it because I get into the flow of painting and it just sort of, flows yes. through me and, yeah. and I'm kind of like like I'm sure you know the feeling because mm. your, your beautiful artwork um that it's just kind of comes and I've got to figure it out I could try and figure it out consciously later and I'm like oh yeah I have no idea what that message is or if that's a message for me or if that's a message for someone else <laughs> yeah and do you find that later on say maybe a long while later you'll suddenly realize oh my gosh there's something happening in my life now and I realize why I painted that sometimes Mm. um but then sometimes I don't think it's actually for me and I'll be at a show or an event and somebody will come and see the painting and it will just speak to the speak speak to their soul somehow and yes I'll be like ah okay that was for you (laughs) yeah Um, and it's often the painting that they buy and want to live with um Mm. so I've got this sort of feeling that the paintings I do they've got somewhere they need to go but I'm kind of the uh, I don't know what the word is channel kind of the channel uh, or the idea it comes through me but it doesn't yes. it's it's to go out into the world rather yes. than it just to I get stay that. With me, like and there's some mm. yeah do you know what I mean I get yeah. that from the art that I do and I think oh I'm just doing this because I enjoy it I don't like you say it's just I'm loving I want to create this image it's come to me for some reason I'm really enjoying this and then um I'll put it out and people will resonate it for some reason and see a meaning in it or get a a feeling from it that I haven't, you know, I haven't seen. You know, I think, oh, this is, draw these little jolly gnomes. (laughs) And somebody go, oh, my goodness. That means so much to me. Yeah. That's, That's amazing. I, it's, I kind of like see it like a healing medicine, like mm. they were bringing these energies through to go out into the world and it's it's for healing the culture in some way, like because yes. it's disconnected, for, like the culture, the overculture is kind of so disconnected from the realness of the land and the earth. Mm. They're bringing these it through in such an imaginative and playful and whimsical way. It feels that it's kind of like a little bit of a like antidote or a bit of medicine or something. To... Yeah. I, love, I love that. I love that, and I think that's what you're doing. I'm doing other people I know in some way. It's it's bringing this information through, putting it out there. And then even if it's just one person that listens to this or sees your art and they have a little shift, positive shift in their life in any way, then it's like something, it is good medicine, isn't it? It's good medicine. And It's incredible. Yeah. We're not doing it 
totally for that purpose, but it's kind of like a a knock on knock on effect or a part you know that comes through, isn't it? Well, maybe I don't know. We're not always conscious of why we're doing things. We just think, oh, this is a good thing to do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Someone receives it. Yeah, it goes, oh my gosh, that was amazing. And you think, oh really? Oh, okay. So it's like putting jigsaw puzzle pieces together. I think, isn't it? But yeah, yeah. What we're doing, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, that just reminds me of this one time I was at a market and it was raining and it was grey. And mm. I had to like really like talk myself into being there because I didn't want to be. It was just like, oh, I want to be in the warm. I'm like, no, my job is to take this out into the world. <laughs> I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be the sunshine today. That's what I'm gonna do. And um, this old man came up to my store, and his like aura was just all grey, and he was wearing all grey, and he was like coming to the store, and then he came came and looked, and then he like opened up like a beautiful flower looking at the art and and then he finished looking at it and then he kind of closed back down and went just like I don't think I'm explaining this very well um but it was just such an incredible moment to see how that effect like his inner child of delight and joy came out for just those few moments it's like this this is why I do this this is (laughs) This is what makes it worth it. This is why I'm standing in the rain and more than. <laughs> yeah, it's beautiful. Oh my gosh. That makes <laughs> I don't know what it is. Your, um, the way you talk about your work, Rachel, is so authentic. And so that description was perfect, you know, of how people react and interact with what you do and what better testimony really that you're doing you're on the right path and to see that in somebody you know and to be able to be able to see that is a real gift I think because not many um not everyone notices these things you know and I think maybe as a visual as an artist maybe um we're more attuned you know empathically in tune to people's responses is that how you feel I mean that's just my interpretation is that how you feel that you're very empathically connected to other people and their journeys as well as your own yeah yeah Yeah. so I'm quite sensitive um very sensitive (laughs) Um, um I could because certain things that have happened in my life I'm quite hyper vigilant as well so people's emotional states I'm uh, and that empathy and hyper vigilance kind of like um that wasn't very expressive <laughs> but yeah no, this is, no. so I'm really really aware of people emo- people's emotional states around me yeah um, to so when I see I can so when I see people looking at my paintings it's absolutely incredible to see completely different responses and emotions that people bring out um and so oh that's beautiful um thank you so the other thing that we were going to talk about was talking about interacting was fairy conversation and a fairy this is beautiful you were talking about this, this fairy conversation so I'll let you tell the story I'm going to sip some tea <laughs> have a little yeah. sip of tea there some tea <laughs> this is Earl Grey tea <laughs> <laughs> what have you got what tea. are you what tea are you drinking oh okay mm. crazy <laughs> so the fairy conversation so but earlier in the year um I had to have an operation on my ankle um I'd had all these that uh, screws and pins put in after that I broke my ankle yeah um, and they weren't happy in there um well my bones weren't happy with them so I had to have those taken out um mm. and not long after that there was a white horse camp um, which is like a druid camp that happens at wild ways for Beltane yeah and um, um, which was really I, I did get to go for a few days which was really lovely <laughs> oh. and 
one of the and we did um uh what's it a maypole dance and some different rituals and things and then one of the evenings one of the ladies this is a brilliant um sound bath gong kind of healer lady mm. and we all went down to the earth and um for this sound bath and as I was have as I was lying there and I'll often have visions and things whilst I'm um having a sound bath and I suddenly became aware of these little f- about a foot tall fairy beings and there's two by my ankle giving me healing and then there was one with her little hands on my head and I could kind of you know when you can you're aware of the room when you've got your eyes closed and you can kind of see that and so I could see them in the room in that way Hmm. um but they were discussing me and chatting away like going wow well, she's living up in the village now. I think this and that about that. And I'm, and the other one was going, well, she needs to spend more time on the land. And I think we need to tell her that she needs to spend more time on the land. And they were like discussing all different areas of my life and disagreeing with each other. And I was lying there going, what on earth is going on? <laughs> and I opened my eyes to like, look and see if I could actually see them with my eye eyes (laughs) and I couldn't and I was like oh I just need to be really quiet so I can listen to them and they don't realize (laughs) (laughs) how funny (laughs) did you get an impression of what they were like you know did they have different voices or was it one older than the other or you know, male, female, female. Um, yeah, definitely female. Um, and they were both. They they were quite opinionated. Two of them were louder than another one. Um, and the one that was um doing the healing on my head was seemed to be a little bit more. I don't know how to put it, like, not that she was in charge, but she seemed to be more, like, if there was a hierarchy, she'd be higher in in it. But then the other one that was very opinionated by my ankle was also also completely happy to go, well, no, I think this. And, Uh, um, yeah if that makes any sense yes and how I saw them in my mind's eye was they were kind of um glowy and ethereal and not fully solid Mm. um with like a greeny like almost like they got greeny blue outline like with the the foot the light folds in their clothes and oh um, wow so and I think they are beings of wild ways um because well, this which is the retreat center. Okay. Um, so that that place has had a lot of ritual and ceremony mm. and shamanic work on the land. So it's very awake and alive. And mm. there's all sorts of um, beings there, um, sort of seen, unseen, and kind of semi. <laughs> yeah. So, me semi seen really. Um, is it open to the public, or is it some? It's it's a retreat centre that you you book a retreat onto. And, yeah, yeah, so you, yeah. You have to book a retreat um, there. Mm-hmm. Um, they do um, druid camps, witchy camps, um, tantra, five rhythms, all sorts of lovely Ooh, things. Sounds amazing. Um, it's the best yeah. place I've ever painted. So I've I've had the absolute magical luck of being invited well asking if I could paint there um oh, wow. my ankle healed a few years ago because mm. I got this uh cellar this dark damp dingy cellar I was painting in and I was really struggling oh. to mm. paint and a friend of mine who runs five rhythms retreats there um was like well why don't you ask and see um mm. so after that last lockdown I um 
found my way to painting there. <laughs> yeah. Um, that's, yeah, sorry. Sorry. Yeah. No, I was just saying this that's interesting that you had that feeling that you needed to go there after lockdown. I mean, was that spurred on by that time and you thought right I'm gonna go for it and find some amazing places to um, work in or I'd first been there um in Sawe in 2019 um mm -hmm. just before I broke up with my ex-partner yeah and when I set foot on the land there it felt I don't know. I had this like intuitive sense that this is going to be an incredibly important place, like in my mm -hmm. life. Mm. Um, and I didn't really know how. I thought maybe it's just I'll come to retreats here quite regularly. Um, but then in the lockdowns, I'd been bubble friends um, with my friend Neil, who's a five rhythms teacher, who when I was in starport he lived a mile away so we ended up in a bubble and going for lots of walks and things and he'd lived there years ago um and he runs like regular retreats there probably like five times a year and new years and all that mm -hmm. and so his connection with that place through our friendship I became more connected and I'd go and help be his assistant on his retreats um, that he could do between the lockdowns and things like that. Um, and then when I was struggling with painting in this cellar, um, he was like, well, why don't you ask Elaine and see what she says? Like, And then Elaine said, well, oh, yeah, yeah, of course you can. Like, uh, um, you're welcome to. And so, and I was really shocked. And after going through all of that, I was kind of like... <sighs> <laughs> in pieces and um exhausted by all of the ankles and moving and everything so it was real solace and real beautiful um just mm. place to be in nature and you can hear monk jack deer barking every day and there's like foxes and owls and it's so just the nature there and the land, the way it so palpably speaks to you. Um, mm -hmm. And then after a few months of painting there, the people I was lodging with decided they wanted to renovate the attic. And I um, had about six weeks to find somewhere else to live. And I tried everything. <laughs> And I went to see loads and loads of houses. And then right at the end, I found this one in Cookley. And so I was just like, fine, that will do. That will do. It's somewhere to live. I'll have somewhere to live. I don't have to put everything in storage. And um, I hadn't really checked it out properly. And then I moved all my stuff in. And then the guy was really weird. So, and I stayed there one night and there wasn't a lock on the door. And I ended up barricading the door and oh, feeling really safe and then the next morning he texts me going oh don't unpack and I was like, okay and then he came and he said that I, he didn't want me to live there uh, okay then yeah uh, um I don't really want to live here either no <laughs> um yeah, so I know I called different friends and I was like I just don't know what to do <laughs> mm. and I had a good cry and she's like why don't you call Elaine and see if you can at least put your stuff in her shed and in a barn and then figure out and she's like come and stay for a few months you can live in the pig oh. pen and wow. pig pen. Oh. Wow. So, <laughs> yeah. um, so, so I am spending this eight months Living yeah. in this converted pig pen. <laughs> I was going to say, are the pigs still there? <laughs> the spirits of the pigs are still <laughs> <laughs> It's got a little log burner and, a, oh. and an electric, um, what's it called, plug thing. Mm. But there's, like, oh, there's the, the kitchen's up around the corner and the toilet's up around the corner. <laughs> Oh, it sounds and gorgeous. It yeah. all days and it was absolutely a complete sanctuary. And 
absolutely be- I mean it was hard like especially the winter was really hard at times but it was ab- it was an absolute delight as well being that close to nature um mm. and the beings there were incredible <laughs> um and the people the, the pr- retreats that the people you meet on these the, this retreat center that come through this like Norwegian shamans and um academics like specializing in like folklore and um animism and it's just wow I just okay. like listen I just want to listen to everybody <laughs> and just soak up everything <laughs> yeah I can imagine That's, um, yeah yeah um and that really um grounded me into a different kind of connection with nature as well the real practical um connection because like I always been like oh beautiful trees hug the trees but I hadn't been like oh out into the woods cutting down wood to then dry it to so it can be firewood and then going and getting it with a wheelbarrow and then working out how to get it to light when it's cold and dark and rainy and mm-hmm. you get home and it's 10 o'clock at night you're like I've got to make a fire why isn't it fire? please fire spirits please <laughs> yeah um so mm-hmm. it, it's given me a different a much more grounded and practical relationship with nature which I think is coming out through my artwork mm-hmm. now too um mm-hmm. and the kind of the level of ethereal and then the level of earthly is sort of finding the thread through because I can be quite airy. I'm a Taurus, but the Scorpio rising and the Gemini moon are <laughs> quite a mess. <laughs> oh, the Scorpio, so yeah, because you're, I, I'm not an astrologer, but I did a little astrology course. Um, beginning of this year about my um birth chart and we learned and it was on a course so we all learned about everybody's aspects in their birth charts and things and so your ascending sign the way I understand it is like your path to the sun that's how you your vehicle to get to the sun so your Scorpio is yeah your pathway to your what, you know who and what you are yeah that's the way What's I understand your... it I'm a Le- Libra rising sign so I'm, I'm a Capricorn yeah but Libra rising so I've got the the earth Venus that's keeping me grounded but then the Libra you know that imagination uh balance connection to sparkly things airy airiness yeah. yeah. And then my that moon. Libra air energy. Yeah. Um, yes. Yeah. And then my moon is in Aries, which is to do with the inner child and expressing the inner child. Yeah. Um, yeah. And fire. Brilliant. Yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> you know, so you've got earth and water and sort of your moon sign. Um, Gemini. Gemini, so um, air. air. Okay. Yeah. Mm. So I, yeah. I find it fascinating. Um, uh, yeah, sorry. Carry it on. It is really fascinating. Mm. Yeah, and the wateriness, because I can be very emotional and sensitive. I think that's that comes from my Scorpio. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, and also that there. connection to the dark, the death and darkness and be, be able to express that as well the dark because yeah. you were talking in your bio you talk about um when you were a teenager and you created some very quite dark artwork that you didn't share I, I mean making that shift from keeping art private to stepping into your power as an artist how how's that come about has it come about through your nature connection and and otherworldly connection that standing in or was it other other things yeah 
So, yeah, as a teenager, I was making some really weird dark stuff. I'd found, I'd learned about um, the surrealist techniques of like finding the image in the image and mm. automatic drawing. And I'd been through some really, really, really dark times in my childhood. Um, and I think that was all kind of trying to, drawing was my kind of coping strategy really um mm. rather than it being art as such it was fully just expression and trying to release um what was needing to come out um and then so and then I went off and did various little jobs and things um and like from care assistant to animal health licensing officer and recruitment or all sorts of things and then in my early 20s, I got very poorly and um, the mental health things from the younger ages came back with an absolute of vengeance and I couldn't leave the house for nearly a year. And the only thing I could do really was draw and paint and get it out. And I, I hit rock bottom and the only thing... And I've been to Glastonbury. I don't feel like I'm telling this very well. Um, no, it's good. No, don't worry. You are. Yeah. I, I'd, I've been to Glastonbury for the first time and picked up some books mm. on like law of attraction and cosmic ordering and that kind of thing. And I, in this sort of rock bottom place, I imagined myself a life that would be a life that would be worth living because mm. the one I was living at the time was not feel I didn't I was really struggling um, with my mental health so I decided that I wanted to be an artist and I wanted to live on a retreat center mm -hmm. <laughs> and very okay. basically I wrote down my life that as it is now almost with a few there's a few extra things that haven't happened yet that I'm working on <laughs> um so and that and I wrote it all down and I was like, that's what I'm going to do. If I'm going to live, that's what I'm going to do. So I did. And I, a few months later, they were doing a fine art course at the local university in Worcester. And I was like, right, that's what I need to do. I need to go. And, and at the time, I could barely leave the house without having a panic attack. And like even going to Tesco was too much for me. Um, but I decided that's, that is the ladder. That's how I get out of this situation. So I went to uni and it was terrifying showing anyone my art because I didn't show anyone it at all. Um, so before I went for my interview, I started showing, I got this friend called Ollie and he died this year, bless him. Um, oh, and he sorry. was like, <laughs> yeah, I showed him my art and he was like, yeah, go and, you know, you, so you've only got one life, go and do that. That's um so I did and I got and I'd done all these like really tight watercolors like of kind of oh look what my skills are like but then in the back of my portfolio I got some really weird dark twisted faces and charcoals and and they were really interested in that and then they gave me a place on the course and from there I um uh, luckily they got a really good well-being center at the university so I got to have a therapist and um managed to stick with it and even like I was you know painting and crying <laughs> at times it was just like this is what I need to do um so by the end of my degree I'd got used to the idea I'd sort of desensitized myself from showing people my art um and was quite happy to like let people see what I've been doing and I got a um there was this thing there was this thing called the speed project um which was run by the European Union and they gave you business training and business funding to start up a business after university so I put together an application and went and did the presentation and managed to get a space on this course mm -hmm. that 
was an extra module module on top of my fine art modules. And so when I left uni, I'd had marketing training and accounts training and had a vague idea of how to run a business. And then um, I moved to Malvern at the end of the last week of my degree. Um, and just down the road from me was this little studio called 4A. Um, and I walked past and saw there was a studio available oh and I was like oh my god that would be a total dream if I could go and paint there uh-huh. um so and then I got an email through saying oh if anyone needs an ex- any extra funding put together a pitch of why you need it <laughs> oh, <wow. laughs> oh, that was so we did <laughs> And then not long later, I got an email saying, oh, here you go. Uh, and um, and I called up the lady, from, and her name was Kay. And when I turned up, she just gave me a massive hug, and we got on straight away. And it was just we were both on the same kind of wa- wavelength. And, and then it sort of started from then. I've had a lot of luck <laughs> mm. from there, or synchronicities, or whatever you want to call it and that was back in 2011 Mm. Um, so I've been learning how to do this I I feel like every day I'm still learning how to do being a artist and a business person yeah yeah and I know what you mean (laughs) it's not easy (laughs) and all these new things that are coming out all the time and new ways of doing things and yeah I can imagine but you are successful though I mean you're you've got you know your beautiful website and I've seen you at the Karen Case Fairy Fair in in Glastonbury that you're going to be at um again soon aren't you in um the end of October yeah the end of October um not sure when this episode will go out it might that might have happened by the time this goes out but yeah. yeah so that's wonderful that you set that intention because I mean I, I've got a background in the, the kind of meditation and coaching that I trained in which was Thrivecraft okay is all based on that um you know allowing the setting intention and um the um law of attraction stuff really and and it's been yeah it's worked for me as well it's you know and it, and like you say it's be careful what you wish for because what you set what intentions you set will come to you um but I think it's always good isn't it even though even though it doesn't feel good necessarily at the time and there can be challenges like you've been through does seem to move us to a better place in the end would you say I mean on the whole the whole yeah yeah. on the whole yeah yeah. um on the whole yeah (laughs) yeah depends yeah depends Um, on the experience and things but really interesting what was um what did you call it thrive craft thrive craft yeah which was set up by my friend and mentor Kay Starr who's based in she lives on the Isle of Cambrai in Scotland yeah. um, and I met her I was looking to do a meditation trainer course in 2013 and they were all in London and then I came across this one in Totnes and um, that's how I met Kay yeah um, yeah to my meditation training and coach training with her so that yeah so that's um yeah I've seen for myself how how this setting intentions and surrendering and all yeah, that. that's not the easy part <laughs> no that's not the easy part because we, nat- we naturally want to hold on to it don't we and um especially in difficult times when we want things to be different um come on and it doesn't work that way (laughs) yeah 
I really like the name Thrivecraft. I'm going to have to look that up later. Thrivecraft, yeah. yeah. That's a real beautiful, Thrive. yummy thing to it. Yeah, thrivecraft.com. Cool. That's website. Cool. She's K star. So K A Y S T A D L A. She's one of my friends on Facebook. So, yeah, look her up on there. And give her a friend request. Yeah. Um, and the other thing we we were thanks for sharing all of that. Um, I'm really surprised loving, I'm actually sharing all this. <laughs> loving here about your journey, and again, yeah. this you know, there'll be people see that that resonate with that that journey um, yeah. you've been on. I mean, I certainly do as well. Um. You mentioned, I made some notes at the beginning, you mentioned about dragons and your dragon connection. And mm -hmm. um, there was a couple of things, wasn't there? There was dragons and trees. But I love what you were saying about dragons and hills. So could yeah. share a bit about that. Okay. Yeah. Um, so around the time I got the studio at 4A um, I moved to Malvern which is this absolutely beautiful range of hills um, in Worcestershire on the border of Worcestershire and Her Herefordshire um, and it's got like 40 sacred springs and it's a very and it's granite and it's an incredibly magical place and um, the first night I lived in the flat that I moved to there I had this dream of the dragon of the hill and it told me that my job in Malvern was to take the energy out, I take the energy of Malvern out into the world. And I was just like, well, I don't know how to do that. When I woke up and I got this um, beautiful Malvern stone wall in my house, which is granite and all the different colours of granite. And I kind of connect with that. And then slowly over time, these drawings, I, I really like to do automatic sort of intuitive drawings and the drawings of the the hills with a dragon sleeping on them. I just kept drawing them and drawing them. And even from afar, more than kind of looks like a sleeping dragon. Yeah. Um, so I, I started to do those. Um, and then... And I'd go onto the hills and really connect with the energy, but it's quite a sleepy sort of, it's very, feels very powerful, but it also feels quite sleepy and like the dragon sort of, if, if I need, if you need me, I'll be here, but I'm, I'm having a good nap. So um, yeah, that's the kind of sense I get of, of that dragon. Um, and then, oh, what was it? A few years later, I can't remember exactly when, was it 2014, 2015, after I'd been drawing all these dragons, I got a, um, somehow, like my first ever mural project was this enormous dragon in Malvern Library and a scene of um, the hills and all different animals reading books. And, I sp and I'd been through a really difficult time that year. Um, with certain things which don't really want to share um but it was something that really broke my heart and but two weeks after that happened I got to paint this enormous protective dragon mural um mm. that I found out later that children when they do their visualizations of their safe space in Wolfen some of them that's their, that's in their inner world and that's where they have as their safe space. Really? <laughs> um, oh gosh. It's delightful. It wonderful. <laughs> yeah. Oh, how beautiful. So it's like a collective uh, and consciousness connection. Yeah. yeah. It's um so the dragon that I saw in my dream that then became my drawings that then became my paintings then got into the library and then are now in children's inner world in their imagination like they've got a link through to that dragon too if they're not doing it 
directly, which I think everyone does, even if they're not conscious of it. Um, That's me. It, <laughs> it's wow. just it's so special. Um, but dragons have started to reappear in my drawings lately, actually, but they're more kind of like sitting over the land rather than curled up on top of hills, which is quite interesting. Mm. But then I'm, I'm in much more of a rolling part of the country now rather than big hills. So, yes, yes. different kinds of dragon energy, maybe. Yeah. yeah. There's a lot of sandstone around here, and I haven't quite understood. I'm still getting to know this land and because it's got a very different feel about it mm. um, to the granite of Morven. It's like. Yeah, I I love hills. I've I'm just, well, Devon is obviously very hilly, and I'm not far over in that direction. Um, is a hill fort like less than a, a kilometer away from me. Oh, cool. <laughs> yeah, and then I've got another hill, like fort that way as well, less than a kilometer that way behind me. Um, there's also like this strange conical hill called Darrick and Beacon, um, which is a big sort of conical, pointy uphill. Um, yeah. I mean, nobody really knows how people in ancient times used these places. I think they probably used very, very sacred places and then became fortified at a later date. Yeah. That's just my feeling that. You know, the purposes have changed over time, haven't they? Yeah. Um, I kind of agree with you there. Because mm. um, they're very, the, the hill forts in, there's two hill forts in Malvern and Midsummer Hill, one of them that's, I think people probably, like, it was their sacred space. And then when things started to happen that weren't so Present, they went up to be with that because it's it's, it's protective, and the dragon will protect them. And yeah. yes, yeah, of course, the dragon energy is there as well. And then um, I watched. There's a brilliant new documentary on YouTube. It's created by it's a podcast I follow called the called the Journey to Truth. Sorry, I've forgotten the name of the two presenters, but. They're based in Illinois, I think it's in America, and they've created a documentary about the Cahokia Mounds, in which are in what are they? the Cahokia Mounds, I think that's how you pronounce them, that are these sacred mounds in Illinois, and... Um, you know, that part, they're, they're Indian burial mounds. Um, but some of them, some of them have flat tops on them and they look really similar to our hill forts. So I think I think it's all kind of like, can I, you know, this these places are global, aren't they? Like the pyramids. And it's just yeah. depending on the culture and the historical narrative, people have named them in a certain way. Whereas... They're ancient, ancient places that, you know, we've lost how they were originally, <clears throat> their original purpose. But, yeah, so it's yeah. interesting stuff. I love it. That's so interesting. I'll have to, yeah. what's it called? It's called <laughs> Cahokia Man. So I think it's Cahokia is C-O-H-O-K-I-A mounds documentary and it's journey to truth are the two guys that have made it so it's only on youtube Ooh, I think. Well, I have a look. yeah it's really that worth really... watch yeah it's fascinating because they go into the um native american culture and beliefs and you know just all the, the history and evidence and giants as well you know burials of these giant skeletons that have so say been um taken away by the smithsonian and hidden away yeah oh wow 
Oh, that sounds really interesting. Yeah. yeah. That's a bit of a tangent, but... <laughs> <laughs> talk about hills <laughs> oh, is that all you want to say about the dragons because i is there anything else you'd like to share about dragons shall we move on to trees oh, oh i'm doing i'm in no, don't worry. <laughs> i do it all the time <laughs> Um, I, well, I guess um, my experience with the Glastonbury Tor dragon oh, yes. is quite different to the Malvern dragons because mm. the Malvern dragon's quite sleepy um, and a sleep, like sleeping dragon. Um, but the Glastonbury Tor dragon, I had this beautiful experience when I was in Glastonbury last year. Um, I felt really drawn to walk up the tour and um, the friend I was with as soon as I was like right I'm gonna go um, he was uh, I had a phone call off someone that he needed to speak to I was like right I'm off I'm, I'm going I'm by myself <laughs> um, and I went up the tour and there was no one else there and it was really um, special and I find when I'm alone in places I can connect I'm, my senses and I'm more open and I can feel and communicate with things more than when I'm with a friend there because you've always got that sort of energy as well mm. um so I walked up to the top and then I intuitively kind of did this I walked around and sang just whatever came to me around the top and I felt I felt the dragon in the tour just sort of like shifting a little bit and it felt really beautiful um but powerful but really awake and um I was like oh this is a bit much <laughs> um but because <laughs> yeah it was just oh okay I'm sure I'm supposed to be doing this um but then as I was walking around this whole painting of the tour just popped into my head and the dragon that was sitting on top of the tour was completely awake and all the dragons that I've kind of experienced and drawn in the landscapes before have been asleep and um like we were saying before we we started recording um there's so much that goes on there it's like woken the dragon up yeah and it's like blood that... what's good <laughs> it doesn't mind <laughs> I don't think it does <laughs> Out of the, this painting and then as soon as I got back to my friend's house I was just like I've got to draw this <laughs> and, it, and it just yeah so I painted that one um but it didn't stay a lot around for long I think I sold it the first time I showed it <laughs> amazing <laughs> um <laughs> absolutely beautiful um but that one's been um licensed as a greetings card of my greetings cards publisher and I think I can't remember if my um license I've got a licensing agent who gets things made into like diamond art kits and cross stitches and yeah. I'm not sure if that one's one of those as well it's got little fairies in it too oh beautiful cool. all these are on your website are they yeah right. yeah great yeah. I'd love to see that oh fantastic and just before we and so I know we're coming up to about I said about an hour and a half <laughs> but I really really I remember when we first connected a few months ago about you coming on you said about the trees and connecting with I think it's a fairy portal in Glastonbury oh yeah does that is that are you able to yeah. remember that one um yeah uh, so there, there's this woodland, I can't remember what it's called, but it's just outside of Glastonbury. Um, and me and a friend went for a walk just before I was doing my Bardic initiation around this time last year. Um, I Actually, it was when I was doing the fairy fair. 
so it was October, um, on the Monday after the very fair, I was doing my biotech initiation the next week, and we went to see if we could find me a staff and whether the woods wanted to give me a staff. So mm. um, my friend's very spiritual, so like we and has quite a lot of experience with like druidry stuff, and so we went and asked the woods if there was a staff there for me, and we walked around. And we did find the staff, but it was Blackthorn. And I didn't feel that I was ready for a Blackthorn staff Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, because there's a lot of associations with Blackthorn, maybe one day, but I'm still quite early on on my path with understanding kind of these sorts of things. And it felt just a bit too powerful. And we went into this different part of the woods. And, you know, when there's just a different feeling Mm. it just changes slightly and it just kind of feels a bit more dreamy and a bit more um and we noticed this little path going off um and we're like oh should we go and have a look and he's like oh this is a fairy place like we must kind of so he spoke to the fair fairy and we found these two trees that like made like a little doorway and went through it and we walked along and um, we saw all these tiny, tiny little mushrooms all over this fallen tree. And then I sort of, you know, when your feet kind of in the land and you kind of just feel pulled and I, I'd never quite had to call it, but there's this just sort of like magnetic feeling that you mm-hmm. need to go this way. And it did. And there was this big red pine tree and in the bottom of it was the most perfect fairy door and it was glowing green (laughs) oh I've got chills yeah and it was actually glowing green and I was just like oh oh my god this is incredible Mm. and um and it's actually real I took a photo of it and everything and um so I think it like in practical reality (laughs) it's like lichen or something or or some kind of green green but it was so vibrant especially against the red mm-hmm. and I just sat there and the you know those little dots of light that you see some like I don't know if you get that too yeah mm-hmm. yeah um little do- dots of light just <laughs> <laughs> and I was just like oh my god this is so special and yeah but I, thought, I was in awe and um I didn't even hug the tree because it just felt like it was too like beautiful mm. to like even touch it. So I kind of was at a respectful distance. <laughs> um, so I, I did a painting of that one afterwards oh. as well. This, and okay. I wasn't going to put fairies in it, but then there was a little bit of paint. It kind of looked like a fairy. I'm like, oh, okay. Yeah. And all these little fairies started appearing, and then in the bark of the tree, there's all like faces in the tree, and then there's um, a fairy up in the leaves, and it was such, it was such a delight experiencing explore like the kind of exploring the painting through the paint as I painted it as well. It was just so magical. <laughs> yeah, that is incredible. <laughs> it sounds like. Yeah, sounds like one of those, like you say, it's like journeying, isn't it? We are journeying with the paints and yeah. wow, fantastic. What a lovely experience. It's one day, I think. We yeah, <laughs> I'd love to do that <laughs> when we're both in Glastonbury or if I come up your way to Shropshire. But yeah, that would be really lovely to do that. <laughs> Raspberry. Um, I guess, I mean, the next time I see you, you're going to be very busy, aren't you, with your stall? Hopefully, yeah. selling lots of art. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but we will. That's That would be a lovely thing to do. Mm. Yes, because the other thing I'm doing at the moment is I'm doing some more events. I'm going to be Hi. doing some, yeah, so little plug here 
I was just doing this yesterday. <laughs> yeah. Um, so what you were just talking about, seeing images in nature. Um, I didn't realise yeah. that had a name or sort of a label to it, but I, I did a little psychic course earlier this year and it's called Nature Scrying. That's what it's called in the sort of Ooh. psychic world, nature scrying, where you look at nature and see faces and figures, which is something I've done, I think, since a child, and then gradually thought, oh, this is the thing that I can use for my art, like like you're doing. And then sometimes, like you say, when I'm creating art, there'll be a blob of paint. I think, oh, yeah, that's so like a little person or a face or something, and then that becomes a thing. So the 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 workshop I'm going to do, which is on the it's on the approach to Sawain, so it's Sunday the 29th of October. Um, it's scrying, so I learned how to do scrying where you use like, and anybody can do it. You don't have to have artistic talent, and you use pastels and uh, scry. For images set an intention so I'm going to do it with fairies where people can scribe for fairies and receive symbols or fairy imagery yeah oh wow that's going to be amazing oh brilliant yeah because I love it it's like you know something I enjoy doing so oh, yeah I should, I should be doing a workshop on this um and also I'm doing a series of online fairy chats as well so inviting as my podcast in my groups and for for my patrons for the public I'm doing these chats where someone comes on does a little chat about what they do and then we have like a group discussion so yeah I thought that be another way to spread the fairy yeah. the fairy word <laughs> a bit of light <laughs> that we all need oh, yeah. really, oh, the world needs fairy things so much at the moment I think yes. I'm really I'm really grateful for what you're doing actually oh, because thank you uh, wonderful I've been whilst I've been painting sometimes I listen to your podcast and it gives me a little bit more confidence in talking about my fairy things because I've often been like oh it's all my imagination <laughs> And it's, it's, I really, yeah. Um, uh-huh. Yeah. And it, it's turning around. Thank you for saying that. It's, yeah, it's turning around. The imagination is how we create our world, isn't it? Yeah. Even from like whoever invented the wheel <laughs> came from their imagination. <laughs> yeah. The whole so, is creativity. Like, I, mm. that's what I'm really enjoying about the Druid tree bardic thing is they've got this concept called arwen which is the divine inspiration which is something i've believed in since i was like could remember believing in anything because the mm. everything's creativity and creativity flows through all things and it's amazing this last few years i've found like fairy people through karen k's thing and your podcast and yeah it's amazing what a magical world we live in <laughs> it is magical isn't it I think I think that's it we I think it's a choice isn't it we can choose we can choose to put our focus to things that aren't great in the world we can choose to put it on well, actually there is there is a lot of good in the world still and all people that are um creating wonderful yeah. things like you yeah thank you thanks for being a wonderful guest Rachel it's been wonderful talking to you and um yeah really appreciate you coming on the podcast thank you so much for having me it's been a delight yeah hello welcome back and thank you for listening to the end of the podcast some final thoughts The part of the chat with Rachel that touched my heart the most was her description of the old man that came to look at her stall on a grey and rainy day and as she noticed him light up from inside as he was looking 
at her artwork on the stall. For Rachel, she said that this made her coming out into the rain cold that day worthwhile. This is such a gift if we can only notice people around us. It's easy to become wrapped up in our own problems and worries and especially this time of year when many of us are rushing around buying Christmas presents, worrying about what to buy, various members of our family or about Christmas Day dinner. But it's important to remember that everyone has their own challenges and some greater than others and to focus on kindness, especially this time of year. Kindness is the greatest gift. And to give someone a smile or a friendly word can change somebody's day. And the opposite is true, of course. I know I've been on the receiving end of both at times when I've perhaps been a bit down and someone's been rude to me and then I felt even worse than those days when somebody says something kind or does something kind and the immediate feeling is that you want to gift that on to somebody else. It's such a small thing and takes so little time to offer kindness to someone and so important at this time of year. And this is what I love about Rachel's story. She said that she decided she was going to be the sunshine that day and she was for that one person. Thank you to Rachel for sharing her experiences so open-heartedly. I thought this episode would be a wonderful way to close the podcast for 2023. I wish you all a wonderful Christmas and New Year and I'll return in 2024 with some enchanting stories. Lots of love from me and the solstice fairies and remember to keep your heart open and be the change.